Hi, everybody. My name is John Yasa. I work at NASA. I have since June. It's been a treat. I'm going to talk to you today about interpolant improvements, not this practical MDO course that other people have been talking about. That's coming later. But for right now, I'm going to tell you about things that have improved in OpenMDO, how you can use them, and some takeaways. Uh, this is very different than making YouTube videos at home. There are five screens, six screens, a lot of people. Uh, it's good to see you here. Thank you for being here. So, interpolants, right? Well, let's talk about them. But first, let me explain what we actually do with them in OpenMDO. So, the idea of an interpolant is also known as a meta model or a surrogate, and these have different terms depending on the field that you're in. The whole idea is that you can fill in data in between discrete points. I'm guessing a lot of you in this room know about interpolants, but I also want to spell this out very clearly uh, to get everybody on the same page. So, you can fill in the data in between these points a lot of different ways, an infinite number of ways. The, the simplest is a linear, this is not a linear fit between them. This is kind of a nice, smooth Akima spline. But there are so many different ways to fill in data uh, between these different points. And this crops up all the time in engineering problems. Um, I was just in a, in a MDO technical exchange hosted by Boeing last week. I don't think it breaks my NDA to tell you that everybody is using interpolants in different ways. If you're an industry, you have, a, you have an aero table data, you have a propulsion table data. Uh, somebody ran some models and they handed you over a, a, a table and you have to figure out what to do with this, right? And so you need to interpolate between it to allow you to do design using this, this model. And so here are just some example different ways that this crops up in actual engineering problems. Some of these I did in my, in my PhD, in my dissertation. Uh, some of them I did at NREL. Some of them I did in other places. But these are all places where you need an interpolant of some sort. Which interpolant you choose, um, either due to performance or due to accuracy, is kind of up to you. But we want to make that as easy as possible in OpenMDO. And when I say we, well, I mean other people so far because I did not work on this personally. It was Ken Moore, it was other people. Uh, I cannot take credit for it, but I will present on it. So let's talk about what your data can look like. Sometimes it's structured. This is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's, it's easy. Um, it's got a nice pattern to it. And I don't mean like it has to be regularly structured. You can see these dots are in different places. That's still structured data. This is easy to interpolate. We can make this pretty darn fast. You can have semi-structured data. Maybe you didn't get convergence at all of your points in the model. Maybe you just have some experimental data. But you can imagine it kind of looks like this grid on the left, but instead some points are removed. It's, it's called semi-structured. And then you can have unstructured data. This could be a hairy beast. It could be terrible, or it could be OK. But unstructured data can look like anything. So these are all three different data types that are supported in OpenMDO for interpolants. All of our, our different meta model options can be used for, for different types of, of structuredness in your data. Uh, again, if you have structured data, you can and should take advantage of it. If you have unstructured data, that's A-OK. -okay. We, can, we can handle that, too. Um, when I say we can handle that, I mean we, only, we don't only compute the function values. We also compute the derivatives throughout the entire process so that it's very easy to use in interpolants within your gradient-based optimization when you're integrating with OpenMDA. I, I did something during my PhD to help me look at multi-dimensional interpolant fits. Um, it became necessary when I was trying to debug something in eight dimensions, and I can't visualize eight dimensions. I can visualize like two, three on a good day. And so I needed some way to kind of dissect this design space understand what was going on, and, and this was a messy thing. It was just for me to, to kind of look at this data in a nice way. Luckily, smarter people have made this part of OpenMDO. It's now built into OpenMDO. So you can have a meta model in your OpenMDO model and query it and kind of make this nice plot that allows you to see how that fit is. Uh, this is built in. It's a command line tool, OpenMDO view underscore MM, MM for meta model and then you supply your run script. You can take a look at the data. Um, it, it's interactive. If you had a lot of dimensions, you can move some sliders and interrogate different dimensions. Uh, it's pretty slick. I, I think Danny Kilkenny was, was the person who headed this up, and, and many other people contributed to making this look as good as it does. Uh, give it a shot. Let us know how it is. If you have suggestions for improvements, or if you just found it useful, uh, please let the team know. It's pretty cool stuff. But let's talk about this. So Rob, I'm not going to say he spilled the beans, but he said some neat stuff, and it's all true. We have fast, fixed interpolants. Sometimes you need to call interpolants a lot, and I mean millions of times, maybe billions of times within an optimization. Let me explain why. Let's say you have a trajectory optimization. You have many points in this trajectory, and then you're optimizing on it. So you call it many, many times. You can imagine, okay, this, this, we need something that scales very quickly here. We need interpolants that are fast. 
ones that we can, we can trust to converge quickly. Um, this is why we need these fast fixed coefficient interpolants. So let's talk about this. Um, previously, we had a lot of flexibility in our interpolation methods. You could have different dimensionality. You could have n dimensions, and it's A-OK. -okay. But realistically, we found really we're using 2 and 3D interpolants pretty often. Maybe you have a, a mock altitude alpha design space for, for your aerodynamic data. Maybe you have throttle code and, and mock for your propulsion data. It actually made a lot of sense to sit down, uh, kind of crunch the numbers, and have these fixed coefficients for the interpolants, knowing that we're just doing this in 2 or 3D all the time. There are some details here. I'm going to gloss over them here, but basically it wasn't able to scale the previous implementation very quickly. But with this new kind of fixed and vectorized way of doing things, um, it, it's much faster for these rel relatively simplistic interpolant cases. If you want to know about the details, I think Ken knows all the details because he did it. He just rose his hand. So let's talk about this. Uh, you can read about them in, in the documentation. They're well documented. There's something called meta model structured comp. Uh, take a look at the docs, give it a shot. Um, it, it's got a list of interpolants that you can use. It, it's small font here, but I've highlighted two, and they're the exact same mathematically, but one of them's much faster because we, we make some assumptions in it. So this is the Lagrange 3 up top and the 3D Lagrange 3 down below. This that sped up version I mentioned, we got, we got that vectorization, we've got some cached coefficients. It's delightful. Here's this plot that, that Rob showed. Look how fast it is. Those orange bars are huge. The blue ones are smaller. We want them to be smaller because if, if we're running this trajectory optimization, we're calling it millions of times. My gosh, this really matters. So it, it's great to see. Personally, we benefit from this a lot uh, on multiple different projects. Um, maybe you can too. This is kind of a, a different but related topic. Um, interpolants matter. The, the type of interpolant that you use matters. And this is kind of a cautionary tale. Maybe this is, is obvious to you, maybe it's not. But be wary of using piecewise linear interpolants. Like I said, the most simple way to interpolate between discrete data is simply to connect the data, is to draw a straight line between each data point. But if you're using gradient-based optimization, this can easily get messy. It can get unfun. Um, and, and the reason why is that this introduces a, a discontinuity. Here is an example animation. Let's go through it together. Take a look at this piecewise linear interpolation. It's easy, but the derivative, bam, changes instantly. That's not great for optimizers. They hate that, I hate that. What if you use a smooth interpolant? This is an Akima spline, it's beautiful. I love that, it's smooth, the optimizer understands what's going on much better. Um, if we try to do actual optimization on this piecewise linear fit, you know what it looks like, you can see the design space, but the optimizer cannot. And it's trying to find the minimum here. And it's trying to find the minimum where the derivative is zero, but my gosh, the derivative is not zero anywhere here because of this piecewise linear fit, right? And so it gets very angry. It says, I'm going to keep trying the same thing over and over again. Um, it doesn't have feelings, don't worry about it. It's just an optimizer. But if we have a smooth fit here, take a look at this. It just settles right in there. It's, it's, it's checking around, but then it's, it says, okay, I'm done. In, in nine iterations, it finds it much better than, than this piecewise linear fit. So you might say, John, this is a contrived case. I'm never going to be just optimizing on, on something with just a linear fit. But what if this linear fit lives within a bigger model? Let's say you are a, propul a propulsion engineer. You're working with many different components that are talking to each other. Here's a model of an engine. And you're using a piecewise linear fit for one of your engine maps here. You have performance of, of some element within your engine. And you're using a piecewise linear fit. This came directly out of work from, from a collaborator at, at MIT, Lawrence Voigt, and he was using a piecewise linear fit with his, within his engine model and was getting some convergence issues in the optimization. And let's go through some of the nuts and bolts, some of the nitty gritty here. On the far left side is an example of using this piecewise linear fit, S linear, or I don't know, slinear, versus Lagrange 2, a smooth, nice curve fit. So if you look on the left-hand side here, this is the actual data that, that was being interpolated. It doesn't look drastically different. There, there's some you know, outputs that are a little bit different, but on the whole, it looks pretty smooth. But if you use this output of data as an input to another component or element within your model, um, it may have more drastic effects, right? Because there are nonlinear operations that are occurring. This middle plot shows that the TSFC, kind of the, the fuel efficiency of the engine, actually changed drastically. The orange line is the Lagrange, the smooth fit. The blue line is this piecewise linear. 
But more importantly than the actual function values, the derivatives were very, very wonky. On this right-hand side, we have the derivative of that fuel efficiency with respect to the, one of the design variables. So, oh my gosh, this blue line is jumping all over the place. It's got some sharp discontinuities. It's not great for the optimizer. The, the orange line lo looks much nicer. So here, we're not just doing optimization immediately on this fit. It's part of a larger model. You may not even think twice about saying, okay, I would like to fit this data. I'd like to do optimization uh, on this bigger model that includes this small, small piece of data. But it, it can lead to some very bad kind of uh, convergence issues, right? This is just one very real life example of this. Um, Lorenz was, was very nice and allowed me to use this in one of my video lectures as an example. I'm using it now today as an example as well. And so this, this just kind of comes down to, hey, actually think about your interpolants. I think a lot of people say, I'm just gonna use whatever is, is normal. I'm gonna use a piecewise linear fit. It's, it's what we used for the past 40 years at, at certain companies. But no, it, it kind of makes sense to think critically about you know, your data, um, the, the smoothness of your data, if it's structured or not, the computational cost and accuracy of your interpolants. Um, and, and OpenMDO helps you do that. I, I wanna be very clear here. It's one, just like please do this, and then two, if you're gonna do it, OpenMDO can help you do that. And so take a look at the meta model options, take a look at the structured, semi-structured, and unstructured meta model options. And if you're using kind of an uh, interpolant that you've baked up yourself, maybe take a look at using one of OpenMDOs. It might be helpful. Thank you, my name is John. What questions do you have? Marco, but the mic is coming to you. Thanks, uh, very nice presentation as usual. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on you mentioned how basically interpolant models can be a bottleneck in the optimization, mm. and I'm a bit confused. Again, I'm not really using this approach, yeah. but I was thinking you could like train your model okay. at the beginning, okay. right? Yeah, and that's most of the cost, and then everything else compared to like you know actual say CFD analysis should be much quicker. So oh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. What, what are what what are you evaluating here in terms of time? Let's talk about this. Um, Marker, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I think you know it. Not everybody's doing CFD in the optimization. We're certainly not for this case. Uh, so for this case here, you can imagine if we have this arrow tabular data, yes, there is some cost in training it, but there's also cost in evaluating it. And you might say 1E negative 6 should be inconsequential. But in some cases, it becomes consequential if you're calling it just so many times during your optimization. And if you're doing a trajectory optimization, you have many points, th this does become the case. What this kind of comes down to, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, we had maybe an optimization that was taking 100 seconds, so very different than having CFD in the loop or even VLM, even, even a more expensive, you know, error model. That went from 100 seconds to maybe, maybe 10 seconds with these improvements to the interpolants. And that's the difference between like, a, like an engineer or a programmer getting bored, opening up a new tab, changing their, their attention. They can just sit there and, and then it runs. And that, that's a worthwhile change. Does that kind of make sense for these very, very low fidelity? Options? Yeah, yeah, I would just, yeah, uh, I was not sure if you were referring to some kind of like overhead cost or just oh, the sure. specific evaluation. No, this makes, yeah, a lot of sense. It's the literal evaluation. 45x is like good, whether it's like from hours to minutes or minutes to seconds. Right, so. right. Thank you. John, thank you for uh, introducing this great new feature. And, uh, um, I have a question about the derivatives. Okay. I guess this meta model, when I create this component, uh, I guess, it, uh, does it compute the derivative analytically or using finite difference? Oh, this is fun. Um, I believe it's analytically. Depending on your method, it's fully analytically. And, and people have taken the time to write down, you know, the analytic expressions, um, even for these n-dimensional meta models. It's not finite difference. So they're, they're perfectly accurate, they're beautiful. Justin, any further elaboration? No, I, I agree. Um, I will just clarify that um, when you use the fixed dimension interpolants, you get derivatives with respect to the input mo input variables. So when you train a meta model, you have a bunch of training data and that gives you a function evaluation where you can then predict. And so we have derivatives with respect to the prediction inputs, but I don't believe we have derivatives with respect to the training inputs. Ken, you can correct me if I'm... Hold on, hold on, Ken. That's correct, Justin, because the training inputs, they're not supposed to move, they're supposed to be fixed, so no derivatives with respect to those. Um, so this is a, a bit of a subtle but important point. Um, if you're building up a model, you, 
oftentimes, like, let's say you're doing a multi-fidelity model where you run a few CFD points and then use this to train a meta model. Um, I'm going to stand up front so you all don't have to turn around to look at me. Uh, the inputs that you're using to train that meta model are then fixed for the course of that optimization. If as part of your model you're computing new training inputs, retraining the meta model and then using that in another part of your model, um, say building up arrow model which you're then passing into a trajectory, then you need to be able to differentiate through the training process itself and then these are not applicable anymore. Then you'll want to use something else uh, because we don't have derivatives through that training process right now. Um, so we. We intentionally sacrificed capability for speed. And there was a note about that on one of the slides. Yeah. I should be clear, though. If you do need derivatives of the training points, like you're changing your training points during your optimization, other non-fixed interpolants in OpenMDO do handle that. And so you can choose to use this very flexible method that gives you those derivatives, or you can use these slightly faster, much faster, fixed interpolant methods. But just for a little bit more context, um, the speedups that he's talking about here are for trajectory optimization type problems. Um, and so these are problems where speed really matters. Um, everything's low fidelity. Not everything in the optimization world is CFD and FEA, as fun as that is. Um, and so when, you're, when everything's low fidelity and you have maybe 50 or 60 blocks in your model, this is where these speed improvements really can dominate. Um, so if you're doing any kind of interpolation, like in a Pi cycle model or if you're using Dimos, you definitely, definitely want to check these out. Hi, John. Uh, can you maybe expand a bit on the high dimensional interpolant? What's the state of that? Oh, wow. Yeah, sure. Um, what do you want to hear about? Like the accuracy, the cost, everything? The options available and... Okay. Like... Where did I have the list of interpolants? Here are some interpolants. Do you want to hand it over to Ken? Yeah, I, I don't know the best answer to this <laughs> because there's so much we can go into. And, and I delve so much into this in, in other work. Um, High dimensional interpolation is tough, let's be honest, right? There's a lot of data, um, the accuracy is challenging, the cost is challenging. Um, there are many built-in interpolants in OpenMDO that can handle the n-dimensional case. I'm not saying you should be using them, either due to a cost standpoint or, or an accuracy standpoint. Um, I, I don't know if I have a good answer. Ken, do you have anything to add on here about like how, how big of a dimensionality have you used with some of these meta models? I mean, I think we've used up to seven dimensions on some, but not above. When you, when you say high dimension, I wonder, do you mean, do you mean much higher than that? Um, Order of 10? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, yeah, the, the thing about, do you, sorry, hold on, the, the, the okay. at-home viewers can't hear you. Hold on one sec. I'm talking about more inputs, outputs than actually the polynomial order or the derivative so order. You have, you're saying like if I had 50 different values, I wanted to interpolate? Like I have 50 inputs and 50 outputs, oh, 50 inputs. or 10 inputs, oh, 10 okay, outputs. Okay. Yeah, the, the main I mean, 10, 10 is a lot. So the challenge there is that your interpolation scheme is only going to be accurate in the dimensions where it has enough data. Yeah. Um, okay, we're getting another mic, one sec. Uh, and so if you have, you know, as a rough order of magnitude, if you were to choose three values for each dimension, three to the 10, so yeah. the, the, at that point, at 10 dimensions, your cost is not, like the interpolant is not gonna be the problem, it's gonna be generating that data, that's the problem. Yeah, but that's what I mean, I have the data and I've been using yeah. like polynomial chaos expansion okay, uh, sure. without the, the AD part, without the derivatives part for okay. now. So I'm, basically what I'm considering is like, should I keep using what I'm using and just put the derivatives there and do that by hand? Or do you have a solution that I just like retrain my data with whatever model you have and that will be easier? You could try it, I don't expect that you'll be happy with the results. Um, yeah. For high dimensional stuff, I think the interpolant will be a lot slower than you'd like. Uh, accuracy would probably be okay, depending on the order that you chose. But. I can plug something here. Uh, there's something called the Surrogate Modeling Toolbox, or SMT, that came out of a collaboration between the University of Michigan and Onera. Super out. Multiple different French institutions. So. <laughs> This SMT toolbox has many, many different methods, some of which are more suited to high dimensionality than some of the things that are in OpenMDO. And I've personally used SMT wrapped in OpenMDO, and the reason why I'm suggesting this is because it provides derivatives for the data that you have. Um, I did it for, for up to, what, eight dimensions, but other people have used it for many more. Um, if you have the, the training data already, the hundreds of thousands or millions of data points, you can and should give that a shot, is what I would suggest. 
We have a question in the corner that I want to highlight. Um, you talked about, um, you know, what happens when you have discontinuous first derivatives. Uh, has anyone ever noticed anything ever happening with having discontinuous second derivatives? I ask that because I like a chemo a lot. Yeah. Because I know I'm not going to overshoot my data. Sure. And I, I've, you know, some optimizers care about second derivatives, but I've never noticed anything myself. But I'm curious. Yeah. Do I have anecdata about this? It it sometimes matters in my head for the, the smoothness of the fit, especially if you're looking at like trajectory optimization, I would say, because th there that would matter. Um, maybe Rob can speak to this. But the, the order of some of these fits is listed here. So like you were talking about the, the Akima fit. We can see some other ones here are order one, three, or five. Um, no, I haven't seen any, any issues with second derivatives. I could see where it could be an issue. I think Rob maybe has. Rob is excited. I, I, I think my, my only comment here is, in my experience, since we're not utilizing second derivatives directly in the trajectory optimization, uh, I haven't seen it from that aspect. And when it comes to overshooting, I feel like that's when tools like the visu visualization and, and seeing, you know, what does my data, uh, how is OpenMDAO going to see my data when it's actually in the model? So if you do have a big overshoot in some place, you can, you can hopefully add, add something in there and, and try to knock that down. I get, that's, that's been my experience in working with that. I mean, Look, logically, right, our optimizers are making Hessian appro approximations, so you would think that it matters. But since they're making approximations, the same reason that probably most of the people in this room thought it was okay to use linear interpolants, my, myself included, honestly, that case that he showed was the, the first time I felt like I saw definitive proof that the, the discontinuities in the linear stuff would really break an optimizer. Um, I thought that it could usually power through it, that it would kind of like smooth them out with its BFGS approximations. Um, so that was the first case I personally saw where the piecewise linear like just broke the optimizer, just did not work. Um, so I, I think logically you can assume that if, you know, if you're like in a really flat area or like a particularly tricky kind of constrained area, non-continuous non second derivatives might cause you trouble. Uh, but I think intuitively you can kind of trust the BFGS approximation to kind of like smooth them out. Graham's making, I'm not sure Graham agrees with me, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you don't have to put them on the spot to, to comment, though. It's okay. Um, but, yeah, I, I would stay away from it if you could avoid it, but it's probably not going to kill you. And well, I'll probably that. regret those words next year. What the heck? <laughs> Other questions, interpolants, metamodels, anything else? I guess I'll just stress, there are other interpolants out there, like SMT, you should definitely check it out. These are not meant to be like the only interpolants you use. They're maybe like the first thing you go to, especially if you have two or three dimensional data, um, you know, let's call them the lowest common denominator, right? But if you have specific needs for your surrogates or interpolants and things like that, you should use the more powerful tools that are out there. Um, SMT, does it also use analytic derivatives? Yes. Uh, some of them have analytic well, I, derivatives? Yeah, I shouldn't say yes so definitively. Some of the methods do have analytic derivatives, some of them do not. Some of them offer training data derivatives and some of them do not. Uh, but on the whole, evaluation derivatives are provided, I believe, for every interpolant. So, I mean, it's kind of a trade-off, right? People like interpolants because they're kind of easy and, and like we had the comment before, you know you're not going to overshoot your data. With some of the more aggressive or advanced interpolation schemes, you might overshoot your data or undershoot your data. And in fact, undershooting, I think, is the problem you were wrestling with on those plots. So if you have like a TSFC of a, for your engine fuel burn or something, or drag for an airfoil, and you're interpolating like airfoil data, and if that, I can guarantee you, if that interpolant, if the drag goes negative, even just a little bit, your optimizer is going to find that negative drag spot and be like, oh, yeah, I, I like this angle of attack 36 that has negative drag. This is, this is great. Let's, let's use that. So, there you want to be careful. And there are some tools in OpenMDO to visualize, and, th and that's why those tools are there, because you, if you're seeing, like, oh, this interpolant's picking, like, this weird thing in it. Mm -hmm. So you, sometimes you have to be really careful with those more advanced interpolants. And they have, so they, our basic interpolants have no tuning parameters. You just pick the one you want to use, and you use it. The more advanced ones, like some of the Krieging stuff, they have tuning parameters that you have to tweak, like regularizations and things that you, you do need to play with.
Hi, Justin. Um, uh, Justin, if you could uh, please elaborate a little bit more. Um, I, I was, you and I were, were whispering offline a second ago. We ran into a problem very similar to, to what was shown uh, a second ago, the propulsion problem. What are some best practices for uh, diagnosing and, uh, and uh, kind of discovering these issues as we... Oh, you know, is best there... practices for how to find the unfindable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like uh, the, the dream would be, you, you know, John showed that, that nice uh, animation that was really cool. That on a real problem, is there any uh, way to do things like that? Yes, probably only if you have analytic derivatives. <laughs> um, if you're using finite difference across your model, it's, you're almost not going to be able to find this kind of problem. Now, you may not run into this kind of problem because the finite difference may be kind of like smoothing out the noise, like unintentionally. Um, that's not really a technical answer. Finite difference doesn't actually do that, but it kind of does it depending on your step size. Um, so, but if you have analytic derivatives is really the time that you'll run into this kind of problem. I guess what I'm saying is if you're finite differencing anyway, there's probably so much noise that you're, you may be wrestling with this no matter what. Um, but if you're using analytic derivatives, then you can set up a run script to basically like, like these are plots of derivatives and this is what you have to do is like look at kind of look at a sweep of the space in univariate kind of space, almost the same way you would debug a surrogate model to look at how the answers are coming out of it. Um, maybe we should make some tools to make that easier. It's not a bad idea. Um, but in terms of a best practice, if you have analytic derivatives, what I would recommend is if you're not sure that your derivatives are smooth, plot them. Um, they're really cheap if you have analytic derivatives usually, and so you should, you should be able to make plots like this. Thanks. I can speak ever so slightly to this. The DOE driver or design of experiments driver is a great way to do parameter sweeps to see how smooth your design space is. And I believe a recent change has included the ability to compute derivatives at each one of these points too. So you can see how smooth your derivatives are as you're changing some design variables or doing a parameter sweep. That was a user request, wasn't it? That was a user request. Maybe it's not actually in there yet. Um, no, no, well, no I'm, I'm just noting. I think that request came in from the community to add that. I'm pretty sure. This is correct. Tucker, Tucker Babcock, a uh, user, was like, hey, can we do this? And then he submitted a poem, and now you can. But he also submitted an implementation. Anyway, OpenMDL is open source. You should contribute to it. <laughs> <laughs> Tucker's here. If you use the DOE derivative stuff, you can thank him. Uh, you can send him an email and thank him. Or thank him in person, I guess, since he's here. <laughs> Anything else? Nothing else? I'll just note, uh, John kind of emphasized it, and he certainly ran into it quite a lot in his thesis work, but if you're trying to do gradient-based optimization and you're using interpolants like this, then good practice in getting both fast and good derivatives out of your interpolants by using higher order ones is very, very likely to improve the quality of your results substantially. Um, what I have found personally is that uh, if you have noisy models, that's usually the reason that your derivatives, I mean, they might be quote correct, you're, you're getting the derivative that your model has. But that's the reason why your optimizer isn't behaving smoothly and converging fastly. And often it'll show up as like a long tail in the optimizer where like it'll get kind of close to the answer and then it'll just like bounce around wrestling with noise. Um, sometimes it just won't work at all. Or sometimes the result is that your optimizations may all work but if you did a sweep of some key parameter, say you optimized an aircraft, but you looked at a sweep of different wing areas, for example. Um, and then so the, the trend you would get as you looked at these different optimal configurations would be noisy. Um, and you shouldn't, if you have a nice smooth model, you shouldn't see that. That's not what you would expect. And a lot of times the cause of that is bad interpolants or bad derivatives somewhere else in your model. I have, uh, I have some question uh, regarding the three-dimensional, so I guess uh, it was uh, the, the 45 times faster model. That, sure. Yeah, so is that uh, can be used for uh, the inputs that are uh, uh, randomly placed in uh, two dimensions uh, or three dimensions? Uh, is that uh, possible or is that only apply for structured or partially structured data? If I didn't know anything, I could just look at Justin nodding and shaking his head. Uh, no, it only applies for structured and, and semi-structured data. Um, a, a lot of these speed-ups in the vectorization comes from mm -hmm. using this, this kind of structure and the sparsity. 
Ken, do you have any comments about if that could be different or does it, is that even possible? It isn't something we worked on the speed up, so um, it's strictly structured that the speed up comes from, not even semi-structured. Nope. In fact, I think we have semi-structured, but I don't think the performance is gonna be something you'd be happy with. I mean, it's, it's probably better than unstructured or creaking or something like that, but I think that, I mean, I guess I wrote the semi-structured stuff, but I think the best use of it is to fill in your missing points from your table and then you structured from then on. So that's probably the, the, the most practical use for it. So. I mean, just as a general comment, right, interpolating structured data is always gonna be faster than unstructured data. In theory, semi-structured data could be nearly as fast as structured. This is where we run into some of the limitations in Python. Um, writing really, really fast unstructured interpolants in Python, or uh, writing unstructured interpolants kind of implicitly requires for loops, which are the kiss of death for speed in Python. Um, so probably it's, it's possible, but you'd have to maybe move to a compiled language to get more performance. But it'll always be slower than structured data. Um, but certainly a compiled interpolant would do far better than what our Python unstructured interpolant does. And also, I have a related question regarding that. So if your uh, structured data has some kind of noise, uh, for example, if you uh, obtain uh, data from uh, experiments and it has some uh, noise, uh, then if we use a uh, regression uh, strategies rather than just interpolating, that noise will be smoothened out. But uh, is that uh, supported? Uh, yeah, definitely. And maybe I should be more precise. I'm not a mathematician. When I say interpolant, I do mean to include regressions. I do mean to include things that do not literally go through the discrete data points. So that is absolutely a feature uh, of some of these methods in OpenMDO. Yes. Sorry, I, I don't think that's actually correct. Tell me more. Uh, our interpolants hit every data point you give it. I was wrong. Um, if you want regularization noise correction, you should check out SMT. Um, they have more powerful interpolants with controllable, tunable parameters. Uh, but our interpolants are strictly interpolating. Um, they Even will hit every data point you give them. The, the, I think that's true for the, all three, right? The structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Um, I'm not sure about like the uh, nearest neighbor stuff. Okay, so it's, it's absolutely true for the structured and semi-structured ones. Um, the unstructured ones, yeah. There's a mix in there. I think, I think the unstructured ones like Krieging, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you can true. dodge them, so maybe John was right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lesson in there for me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just to be clear, the fast ones are strictly interpolating. I think at this point, um, we should thank John first time. We should take a 15-minute break.